Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Laura Wexler. I'm one of the founders and producers of the Stoop Storytelling Series. On behalf of myself and Jessica Hankin, um, we want to just say how delighted we are to be here tonight in this beautiful space um, to create another beautiful space for these stories. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the Stoop, but if you're not, um, we operate on a very, very simple idea, which is that the sharing of personal stories makes us familiar to each other. And I think you will find tonight that even though the stories you will hear have settings that are maybe unfamiliar, whether it's Syria, Ecuador, um, wherever, um, you will find that the emotions um, in the stories are familiar. And in this way, um, hopefully you will um, find that folks who are strangers may feel less different to you uh, and from you uh, after the stories. Um, so each um, storyteller will come up and share a personal story. It will be about seven minutes, and, um, and we'll go one story after another, and, um, and then we'll conclude after that with some remarks from Paul. So our first storyteller of the evening is Monica Guerrero Vasquez, and she is the first in her family to attend college she holds a bachelor's and a master's degree in computer science and information systems. She was an inaugural fellow of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative where she um, obtained a master's degree in public health. And now she is the executive director of the Center for Health and Opportunities for Latinos, also known as Centro Sol. And she's passionate about working for community-centered solutions to address the issues that affect um, that affect immigrant Latino youth, depression among um, immigrant Latino adults, and she wants to build community cohesion to address all of these issues. So please welcome Monica. <laughs> Whew. I didn't drink enough wine. <clears throat> So I think it was a weekday, and I think it was Wednesday, the day that my dad had to leave. He put us in bed, he gave us a kiss, he smiled, and he said, I love you, and I'll be back soon. At that time, Ecuador was going through a huge economic crisis, and my parents lost everything, including hope. After several months of seeing my mom struggling of not being able to get food for us. She will be able to bake bread and get some spinach and rice and we will eat that for weeks because we had a huge debt. So my parents decided that my mom had to leave too. So the process was similar. She put us in bed one night. She gave us a kiss and her blessings and she said, I love you and I'll be back soon. I was devastated when she left because I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know when I would see my parents. I didn't know what soon meant. So they trained me to take care of my siblings. My brother was two, my sister was seven, and I was 10. I was in charge of taking care of them, taking care of the house, paying the debts, I became very independent. I will get groceries and I will try to emulate everything my parents did for us. So waking up early, taking my sister to school, go to school, and all the other things. At some point, I decided that I had to drop out of school. I miss my parents so much and I couldn't handle everything that they were doing and they did for us. So with more time to take care of my sister and take her to school and take care of my brother, I decided that I had things, everything under control. I was a grown up. My parents will be proud and happy to see me that I was able to handle everything they left for me. But at some point they decided that they wanted to take us with them. They saved some money and they said, um, we will be able to, take to get tickets and bring you with us. I didn't really want to go. 
See, I wanted to see my parents, but I wanted them to come back as they promised. When we arrived to Spain, my brother cried because he didn't recognize my dad. I was 11, and I thought, see, I was right. Coming here was not a good idea. I didn't know where I was going. Everything I knew was in Ecuador, and now I was in this place that I don't know what it had. Things in Spain didn't get easier for us, or for me. My parents were what I call the modern slaves, so working 24-7. My mom was a housemaid, and she will spend six days a week with this family that she was taking care of, and we will see her once a week, the happiest day of the week. And my dad wasn't allowed to leave his job for any reason. So we lived in an industrial area, no neighbors, no parks, no friends. And um, I would wake up super early to, take, to get my siblings ready and go to take the bus to go to school. And then I would drop them off to in school, and then I'd go to my school, and I'd pick them up, and I'd come back home. The commute was long. But what I remember um, then was that I will wait for the bus, and sometimes there were cars pulling next to me, and, and the man from the car will, will ask, how much do you charge? And I will get so angry and so scared. So I will look down and just think, I'll go to college, I will find a good job, and I will leave. Nobody wants us here anyway. <laughs> and I will pray that the bus will come fast and that these guys will just leave us alone and that my siblings and I will be safe. In the back of my head, I just thought, college is going to be freedom. And my mom will tell me education for a woman is freedom. So that's the only option you have. I don't know how I did it, but I graduated from high school with honors, and I got a scholarship to go to college. I didn't get, had a lot of mentorship in terms of what I love and what I'm good at, but I was in college. And when I was there, I got selected from a pool of thousands of applicants from all over the world to be an expert on mission with the United Nations. Of all the countries that they could have sent me, they sent me to Ecuador, to the Andean region. I am from the Andean region. They didn't send me to my town, but it didn't matter. I went to the mountains, and after a decade of being in Spain, I finally was in college, and I was going back to my country. And I was so happy. Uh, I went back to my roots, my accent came back quickly, I went back home. But my happiness lasted short. I was working for the mayor's office and this girl came to me and she said, um, can you help me set up my weekly call with my parents? I said, sure. Um, how long have your parents been gone? She looked at me very sad and she said, I don't really know them. They left when I was three. And that felt like a punch here. And all my memories of all the things that we went through came back. That moment changed my life. I wasn't the expert on mission anymore. I thought, Why can I, what can I do? What can I do to change this? I'm not ready, I'm, I'm not ready, but I want to change this. I want the kids to be happy. Kids should not be without their parents. So when I finished my mission, I went back to Spain and I applied for a master's program and I was accepted, but I promised my parents that when I graduated from college, I will work and help them. I had three part-time jobs while I was doing my master's but my parents stopped working 24-7, so we had dinner all, to all together every night. 
And when I graduated from the master's, I found a decent job, as my mom promised. And on the side, I would work with immigrant parents to help them use technology to connect with their kids back home. And I started doing international cooperation with indigenous communities in Latin America. But economic crisis hit my life again. And in 2011, I made my way to Baltimore. Baltimore became like a home for me. I found people who looked like me, who spoke like me, and who were going through the same struggles that we went through. And I'm so grateful that life brought me here. I feel that I found a place where I fit, where I'm accepted for how I look, because I've never been white enough or blonde enough. Here, I am blessed to serve moms and dads who look like mine. And most strongly, I work with kids who remind me and my siblings. See, my work here became like um, an extension of my life. I found a, a sense of purpose that my skills finally were tools to help others to relieve their pain and their struggle and their loneliness. And I'm so fortunate and so happy that my dreams came true. Sometimes I daydream that I go back in time and I talk to little 10-year-old Monica and I tell her, Monica, it's okay to feel lonely. It's okay to be sad and depressed and abandoned. It's okay to feel that nobody loves you and nobody accepts you and that you're different and that you're different is bad. I would love to comfort her and say, Monica, you will make it to college and you will help other kids like you. I'm sure she will be so happy. Thank you.